welcome to this FIRE medical webinar titled Mechanical Power and the Role of Adaptive Modes in Lung Protective Ventilation. We're very happy to have you join us today. And we are honored to be joined by Ihad Daoud, who is our speaker for this presentation, Professor of Medicine at the University of Hawaii and President of the Society of Mechanical Ventilation. I'm pleased to inform you that the full live webinar is eligible for one contact hour of CRCE accreditation with the American Association of Respiratory Care. And please expect to receive an email from Bayer with a post webinar survey. Following the presentation, there will be some opportunity for the Q&A. If you have any questions about the webinar, please pop them in the Q&A box and we will address those at the end. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Dewey. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody and uh, good morning and aloha from Hawaii. Um, it's good, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, uh, so the topic today um, is the mechanical power and the role of adaptive modes uh, in lung protective ventilation. Um, it's a very long topic and maybe a little bit complicated uh, in the beginning, but we'll try to make it simple. Uh, we might not stop at every uh, slide, but we'll, again, um, for any questions, please let me know. So the learning outcomes today, we'll try to discuss the concept of mechanical power and how to calculate it. Um, what's the concept of mechanical power as lung protective strategy and the relationship between mechanical power and ventilator induced lung injury and mortality and describe the role of adaptive ventilator, uh, ventilation modes in reducing the mechanical power. Uh, quickly, we'll talk about what is energy and what is power, what is the mechanical power. Again, how to calculate it, uh, relation to ventilation, induced lung injury, transpulmonary mechanical power, transalveolar mechanical power, and again, the role of adaptive ventilator modes. Some research and some questions yet to be answered or still uh, not fully understood. Uh, quickly about the respiratory physiology and the mechanics. Um, very important to understand the respiratory physiology uh, to understand what is the mechanical power and what are uh, the vin uh, adaptive ventilator modes. So all the factors that have to be accounted for are all the factors that we use when we set the ventilator, uh, the tidal volume, the driving pressure, the inspiratory flow, any spontaneous breathing. We have to understand the respiratory mechanics and the ventilator modes. Um, and recently the mechanical power uh, since <clears throat> it's been coined in 2016. So we'll talk about the equation of motion initially. Uh, basically, it's derived from Newton law of physics, uh, which state that the ventilation pressure, which is how much uh, pressure goes to deliver the tidal volume to the respiratory system, it has to overcome three things. The elastic pressure, which is to inflate the lungs and the chest wall, resistive pressure uh, to push the air flow through the airways, and the peep to keep the alveoli open. So it's described as if the patient is passive, not breathing, as P-vent. If the patient is active, so it's usually a combination between the ventilator and the patient. So P-MOS, muscle pressure, plus P-vent. Again, it's a pressure to overcome elastic, P-elastic, plus P-resistive, plus the PEEP total. Again, described here, if you convert um, the pressures, so it becomes elastance times volume, plus resistance times flow plus PEEP. So what is ventilator-induced lung injury? And it's been uh, talked about for many decades uh, right now. And it looks like every couple of years, we have more understanding um, of the factors that cause ventilator-induced lung injury, or we have uh, more types of ventilator-induced lung injury. Unfortunately, uh, nobody knows what's the exact incidence of ventilator lung injury because we usually misdiagnose it. Um, but again, um, it depends on um, the alveolar stress, usually described as pressure going to the alveoli, and the strain related to the volume. And recently, the mechanical power, which again includes every component of mechanical ventilation. So it includes the tidal volume, the inspiratory pressure, the measure of stress, the flow rate, inspiratory time. So to describe mechanical power, uh, power in physics or is the energy delivered from the ventilator per minute. And as we mentioned, it incorporates all the components, tidal volume, flow, inspiratory pressure, uh, inspiratory time, P 
PEEP and respiratory rate. This is kind of a slide to make it look a little bit um, maybe more uh, visual, uh, how every component are interrelated um, during one breath. The pressure drives the volume, uh, the flow uh, drives the volume, the PEEP, the respiratory rate. And what we don't talk about much is the uh, patient P muscle or the muscle pressure of the patient, because that also uh, can uh, interfere with uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. And we all heard about the new term uh, p silly or self-induced lung injury. The um, ventilator-induced lung injury forms that we know so far, uh, barotrauma, atelectat trauma, volutrauma, ergotrauma, usually from the energy, biotrauma, and reutrauma, which is kind of newly described uh, as the effect of change of the a lung matrix from the flow given to the lungs. Okay, so the components of mechanical power, usually energy described as work in physics and that's measured in joules. So energy or work are synonymous, we can use either one of them. Work is basically force causing displacement. Um, which the force will be the pressure the ventilator is giving and the displacement, how much tidal volume is going in and through the lung. The word power is basically the energy per unit of time. Um, so in our case, it will be joules per minute. Um, sim to simplify things a little bit, the mechanical power will be uh, 0.098. That's just a conversion um, to, get the uh, to get the power. Uh, multiply by the respiratory rate, multiply by the pressure in centimeter water, multiply by the tidal volume in liter. So if you look below here, those curves uh, on the left side, this is a curve in volume uh, controlled mode. And you can see here, you zeros here, you're starting from PEEP, um, the inspiratory uh, limb of the, of the pressure goes up, and then that's a square wave form or constant flow, and then exhalation happens. So the area in between the inspiratory limb to the right and the expiratory limb, all the area under the curve is the mechanical power. Same as in pressure control ventilation here. Um, like when we're starting from zero um, here, we're starting from PEEP. And as the inspiratory inspiration goes on, and usually uh, it uh, looks like a square, um, the airway pressure is a square or rectangle and exhalation happens here. And if you compare those two both curves, I know the volume is a little bit different. Usually pressure control has a bigger area under the curve, which causes uh, higher mechanical power than compared to volume control. This slide, uh, again, um, uh, hopefully it's not too graphic for you, uh, but really helps understand the mechanical power. And uh, I will play it. This is from Rocky IV, where he's being hit in the, in the face. So think about the punches here are the ventilator uh, giving the patient the breath and poor Rocky here is the lung. So he's being hit, that's the pressure. How many time, um, how strong are the punches? That's a driving pressure. How many times you get punched per minute? So that's the respiratory rate. And it's very important. And sometimes we don't think about it much. How very important is the respiratory rate and how far his head bubbles every time he got hit. And that um, symbolizes the tidal volume and the flow. And as he said uh, in the uh, next movie, it's not about how hard you got hit. It's about how, how, not hard how you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much can you take and keep moving forward? Same implies to our lung. How much our lung can withstand um, the hit or the power is getting to it every single breath? Um, so by this, you just can understand that higher driving pressure will cause high mechanical power, high tidal volume and high inspiratory flow will cause high mechanical power and how many times uh, you breathe or the ventilator applies the respiratory rate, um, it can in influence the mechanical power. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the components of, uh, of work in general. Those are again the same curves that we talked about before, pressure volume loop or pressure volume curve to the left is on volume control. 
mode and on the right is on a pressure control mode. Um, so you can divide uh, the curve into uh, different components. On the left here in blue is the, called the elastic component, uh, which is a combination of the peep and the tidal. So, um, and the green one here is the resistive. Again, same in pressure control. In blue is the elastic, uh, peep, tidal work, and resistive work. So what, what does that mean? Resistive work, the one in the, in the right, is just the work dissipated as heat to generate the flow through the airway resistance. So it's just the work to, uh, to get um, the tidal volume through the airways. Now the elastic work is the work needed to expand both the chest wall and the lungs. Uh, and you can further divide it as we talked about as peep work and tidal work. Um, tidal work will be the elastic work, that big one, minus the peep. People um, went a little bit uh, to complicate it a little bit more and they decided to some, uh, call something called inspiratory work. Inspiratory work basically because peep is a static, it's just energy stored, it doesn't move every breath, it's there. So the inspiratory work will be the work, uh, the tidal work during the breath uh, and the resistance. Of course, the total work is the whole work generated by the ventilator to deliver the pressure to the respiratory system. This is again, almost the same that we were just talking about, maybe a little graph, and you can see the airway pressure here. This part is the peep to the left, and the tidal uh, work is up here. You put a plateau pressure and that's the resistive work. Same with pressure control. And here, this is spontaneously patient, uh, non-assisted at all. So he's breathing a, a sine flow. And again, it's divided in elastic and resistive. So how do we calculate uh, mechanical power? Um, I'm not gonna uh, really go into much, much details about different equations, but uh, if I go to the previous slide, basically mechanical power is the integration of the pressure volume curve. And I'm not a mathematician, probably most of us are not. Um, I don't really remember or understand cal calculus any, uh, anymore, um, but it's basically if you integrate all this area under the curve, you're gonna get, and multiply it by the respiratory rate and a conversion factor, you will get um, the mechanical power. And because of that, um, much more smarter people came with equations uh, to calculate the mechanical power. And as, you, as, you, <clears throat> as we talked about, the equations for volume control are different than the equations of pressure control. So you can read about those. Um, but again, as we mentioned, it's the volume in liter, delta volume, multiplied by the pressure, which again include the elastic uh, static, uh, which is the peep, elastic dynamic, which is the tidal, plus the resistive, multiply by the respiratory rate, multiply by the conversion factor. So volume times pressure times respiratory rate times conversion factor gives us the mechanical power in joules per minute. <clears throat> so this is just an example, uh, again, of how to calculate it quickly. This is a patient on the left here on volume control mode uh, with a square constant flow. And you can see a pause here, the peak pressure, plateau pressure, and the tidal volume. And uh, the equation here was the minute ventilation multiplied by the peak inspiratory pressure uh, plus the PEEP plus the inspiratory flow divided by 6 over 20. So in this case here, 5.45 multiplied by 37, the peak, plus the uh, 20 over 6 divided by 20 comes to 10.9 joules per minute. And this is in pressure control. And here's the equation again, conversion factor multiplied respiratory rate multiply by tidal volume uh, with multiply by the driving pressure plus PEEP. So you get um, mechanical power of 16. So to be honest with you, as I said, I am not a mathematician. Um, most clinicians are not are. So how are we gonna calculate? It's very hard to keep um, uh, checking the equations like you know frequently to measure the, uh, the mechanical power. And a lot of times, the respiratory rate changes, the respiratory mechanics changes, so the volume change, the flow change, 
uh, tidal volume change. So you have to keep uh, going every couple of minutes and calculate it, which is uh, probably not realistic or practical. Um, this is um, a picture here, screenshot from uh, one of the Bella Vista ventilator. And I know this is not maybe not yet available in the market yet. I was lucky to have that software, but uh, not on any clinical patients. And the ventilator basically calculates for you um, the tidal work, the inspiratory work, um, and the whole mechanical power all the time, constantly. So I think this is very important because, again, uh, none of us can keep calculating it every couple of minutes. So it's nice to have this uh, automatic calculations. Uh, now we'll go, go quickly about uh, whatever we were talking, we're talking about the mechanical power for the whole respiratory system. And as we understand, there is resistive work, air going through the airways, endotracheal tube, the connection of the ventilator. Um, some part of the elastic work is to inflate the chest wall. And probably you can't hurt the chest wall. We're more concerned about causing uh, ventilator-induced lung injury at the alveolar level. So um, if you have an esophageal balloon and you can measure the transpulmonary pressure, um, as you can see in the slide, this is airway pressure, flow, esophageal balloon, and you can get the transpulmonary pressure. You can calculate uh, the transpulmonary mechanical power. Again, the equation here is another surrogate equation. Um, how about transalveolar mechanical power? And this is a recent study that we actually published a couple of months ago. Um, and basically, again, with the use of esophageal balloon, but instead of measuring the tidal volume, the total tidal volume going to the patient, now we're able, we use with the use of capnometry, able to calculate the dead space and remove that uh, dead space from the total tidal volume to get the alveolar tidal volume. And by this, we can get alveolar compliance, alveolar flow, alveolar resistance, and calculate the transalveolar mechanical power. So these are the stress and the strain going into the alveoli, not the chest wall, not the resistance of the upper airways. Now, um, of course, we're all common uh, humans, um, even all mammals in different shapes and forms. Um, so having only one number to look for, which is the, uh, the mechanical power, might be different depending on uh, your ideal body weight, your compliance, your uh, functional resistance, um, uh, FRC and the total lung volume. And of course, you can understand that if you, um, if you ventilate a patient that big, uh, you're going to get higher mechanical power versus a patient that small, you're going to get a different mechanical power. So I think it's important to look at the mechanical power um, in the form uh, or index it to relation to some other forms, whether it's uh, some people did it with their ideal body weight or the compliance or the amount of aerated volume. And we'll uh, touch base on that a little bit at the end. Now, what is the relation of mechanical power with uh, elastance and resistance? Um, this is a study from Gattinoni. Um, we don't have to go through everything, but as you can see, this is the resistance um, in squares and this is the elastance uh, in circles. And the elastance in general has more weight than the resistance in calculating the mechanical power. Uh, same, uh, another slide from the same article. Um, again, this is the, the PEEP, effect of PEEP uh, on mechanical power. This is the effect of the respiratory rate on mechanical power. And this is the combined effects of the tidal volume, the one to the left, tidal volume flow and driving pressure. And of course, as you can expect, um, the flow, tidal volume, driving pressure have the highest effect uh, on the mechanical power. Any increase in them uh, will increase the mechanical power, uh, followed by the respiratory rate, followed by the peak. Um, and again, there is some discussion uh, about do we even have to include the peak in the mechanical power? Um, still some questions to be answered, and we'll touch base on them. Um, sorry. This is another um, uh, kind of review article by Dr. Gattinoni, and I would recommend um, if you want to understand more or dig more into mechanical power um, to read 
the articles uh, by Dr. Gattinoni and Dr. Marini because they really uh, dig deep into it. Sometimes they have um, a lot of um, mathematics and it might be hard. Um, but it's basically they talk about the physiological foundation, epidemi epidemiological validation, and personalization. Again, it's a busy slide with a lot of talk, but here they try to basically find what the threshold for mechanical power. You can see that they changed here the PEEP, the tidal, uh, in this one, they changed the tidal volume. Here they changed the driving pressure and they changed the respiratory rate. And they pretty much had the, biz, um, uh, the same effects. And what they find is in, um, somewhere in that gray zone uh, between maybe four and 12, maybe a little bit safer mechanical power. We'll go through some studies uh, to talk about the relationship between uh, why mechanical power is important and what's the relationship between mechanical power and ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, if you see here the, uh, the CAT scans, this is the patient at the start. This is the mechanic transpulmonary mechanical power, not just the total mechanical power from zero to 30. And of course, uh, 20, 25, 30, especially transpulmonary mechanical power is very, very high. Um, when you go a little bit, uh, 5, 10, you start seeing some isolated densities here. You can see that there's some kind of sort of injuries happening. The more you in the mechanical power increase, you start getting the edema and the consolidation. And on the extreme uh, high mechanical power, you can see typical ARDS uh, with severe consolidations, whole lung edema. Um, and you can um, tell that this patient actually looks like he's on the prone position. So they found in the study that the higher the transpulmonary mechanical power, the higher um, the risk for ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, this is another um, nice study that uh, tried to look at the effect of mechanical power and mortality during uh, mechanical ventilation in patients without acute respiratory distress syndrome. And we always talk about um, mechanical power in ARDS, but even uh, normal lungs or non-ARDS might be affected. Uh, so this was um, uh, basically an analysis um, of three randomized clinical trial. And the conclusion is in ICU patients receiving invasive ventilation, uh, for reasons other than ARDS. The mechanical power was an independent association with mortality, and the findings suggest that mechanical power hold an added uh, predictive value over its individualized components. Of course, as we talked, the driving pressure, the tidal volume, respiratory rate, making a, a mechanical power an attractive measure to monitor and target uh, in these patients. Uh, again, another study is uh, uh, this by Coppola. And there is a lot, plethora of uh, studies right now on mechanical power. Almost each month, more studies come about mechanical power. Um, the effect of mechanical power on intensive care mortality in ARDS patients. Um, and again, as you can see here, maybe it's sorry, a busy slide. Uh, the tidal volume was significant, uh, plateau pressure, a significant contributor, elastins is the whole respiratory system elastins and the lung elastins. Um, so we're going to go to the key points that they find uh, that mechanical power and trans uh, mechanical power did not influence the intensive care mortality. Uh, so in their study, they found that it did not influence mortality. And I put this slide just to show that again, we do not yet have a consensus or full understanding um, of mechanical power and its relation. Um, they found that given same PEEP, the two other components of mechanical power, which are the uh, respiratory system elastins and airway resistance, were not different in determining the intensive care mortality. But they found that when mechanical power was, was normalized to the well-inflated tissue and the compliance, it was an independent associated with intensive care mortality uh, in patients with similar age, SAPS, and ARDS severity. So practically, they indexed the mechanical power to the 
amount of well inflated uh, tissue and compliance. They did the index and they found it is related to mortality. Um, same for transpulmonary mechanical power when it was normalized to the well aerated tissue seems to better predict the outcomes compared to the mechanical power normalized to the respiratory system compliance. So this study basically just raises more question about should we index the mechanical power to other uh, factors. Here again, another, um, another nice study, uh, time varying intensity of mechanical ventilation and mortality in patients with acute respiratory failure. Um, so this was um, a prospective cohort, cohort of patients, pretty big cohort, 1,589. Um, and they compared the mechanical power and they found that mechanical power above 17 uh, joules per minute had higher mortality, <clears throat> excuse me. And you can see here, um, those are the, in uh, purple here, above 17 joules per minute uh, had higher mortality compared to the ones in blue, which had less than 17. Uh, another um, uh, study here, and it was a meta-analysis, um, mechanical power of ventilation associated with mortality in critically ill patients. Uh, so it's meta-analysis of two observational study. And here to the right, um, above one, is the worst mechanical power. And you can see that everything, um, the higher the mechanical power, was related uh, to mortality. Um, and again, they took, they calculated the safety cutoff value of 17 joules per minute, like the last study we talked about. Um, this again was another study in, um, published in our journal of mechanical ventilation, uh, which talks about the correlation of mechanical power and its components with age and its interference in the outcome for the COVID uh, subjects undergoing pressure controlled ventilation. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through the whole curves, but again, you can see this, uh, the survival was in better, significantly better for people who had lower mechanical power compared to higher mechanical power. Uh, if you look at the numbers on the left, actually those, uh, those patients had, even the ones who survived had significantly high mechanical power. Okay, so now we'll go to the second part of our um, talk here. Since now we, I think we can all agree that mechanical power uh, is related to some ventilator induced lung injury and maybe even mortality. So how can we clinicians at the bedside uh, can help the patient or lower our, the mechanical power? Um, so quickly about adaptive ventilation modes um, or the AVM mode. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a mode under classification of closed loop modes. And we probably all heard about closed loop modes. Um, basically they automatically adjust uh, the ventilator um, <clears throat> uh, parameters like the tidal volume, respiratory rate, the pressure based on an optimum target scheme, which target the lowest cost, or you can say energy to the patient. Uh, so if you look at the classification of uh, mechanical ventilation modes, uh, those are the newest generation um, uh, schemes, which are called optimal target scheme or intelligent target targeting scheme. The word adaptive meaning you can see it adapts to the patient condition, uh, the patient uh, spontaneous or controlled um, respiratory rate. Um, so adaptive ventilation mode, with, again, it's called AVM2. Uh, and the reason the, it's called AVM2 because the initial one, uh, AVM1 was very similar to the other modes, which called ASV on uh, the Hamilton ventilator. And there's another mode in, um, on another ventilator, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, so what is AVM2? It's a pressure controlled ventilator mode. Uh, and people think about it as, again, as uh, one, one mode. The reality is that mode could be multiple modes. Uh, for example, if the patient is passive and not having any respiratory effort or PMOS, the ventilator becomes, uh, every, every breath becomes a controlled pressure controlled ventilation. The difference from pressure control is the ventilator is the one that adjusting the respiratory rate, tidal volume, inspiratory time and flow 
according to the respiratory system condition. If the patient is doing some breaths, but not to the full extent, that mode becomes almost as an IMV or intermittent mandatory ventilation. Some breaths will be controlled and some breaths will be pressure supported uh, mode uh, breaths. Not to confuse it with SIMV because it's not SIMV. Um, and if the patient is triggering every breath uh, even higher than the target respiratory rate, most of those breaths or all of those breaths becomes uh, basically pressure supported. Patient triggers and the ventilator gives them the pressure uh, trying to get the target tidal volume. And we'll talk about it a little bit. It might be confusing from the beginning, but it's actually pretty easy. So um, adaptive ventilation mode two was developed in 2017. And the target scheme uh, tried to target is the mean inspiratory power um, delivered by the ventilator as the basis of its optimal target scheme to reduce the mechanical power. And as you can see, the formula here and another formula are pretty complicated. Uh, and this is engineering that I can't even um, say that I really understand it. But it takes, uh, the equation takes in work um, in consideration uh, compliance, respiratory frequency, resistance, inspiratory time, the dead space, minute ventilation. Um, so we're not going to go through the equation. To, so don't worry about this. So how does um, the adaptive ventilation mode work? Um, the clinician has to set a couple of important things. Uh, the gender, whether it's male or female, and the height, uh, because then the ventilator calculates for you the ideal body weight of the patient. The a clinician has to set the, uh, the PEEP level, um, whatever, whatever way you, you put your PEEP or you decide on your PEEP. Um, and, the, and the clinician also have to dial the percent minute ventilation. Percent minute ventilation is what the ventilator will try to target how much minute ventilation. And uh, usually it can go from somewhere between 20% to up to 300%. Most of the time, if you're starting for the first time, um, it's a good place to start at 100, 125%. And 100% meaning... Um, 100 milliliter per kilogram per minute, minute ventilation. So if my ideal body weight is 70, 100% uh, for me would be seven liters per minute. So the ventilator, according again to the respiratory mechanics, which the ventilator measures all the time, the ventilator will, uh, so you see in here this uh, right side, this is a patient of the compliance of 48, resistance of 12, and having no spontaneous breath. And the ventilator, according to the equation, wants to target a respiratory rate about 15 with a tidal volume of 46. And all the time, breath by breath, the ventilator tried to uh, adjust that target minute ventilation. If the patient is breathing faster, it will try to keep on that uh, white line. If you look at here, this is a patient now with uh, bad compliance of 23, a little bit high resistance and he is having some spontaneous breathing and you can see here's the same window here with the target uh, and the blue dot is the patient so now the ventilator knew that the compliance worsened and it start to target 337 so lower tidal volume slightly higher respiratory rate again the whole idea is to keep the mechanical power and try to reduce the driving pressure and tidal volume to keep it in the safe, um, safe zone, usually um, that green screen is in the safe zone. Um, this is another uh, nice um, um, screenshot here. We took it from a patient uh, who was in pressure control uh, mode and the red is the airway pressure, the white is the flow, the tidal volume. And you can see here, as soon as we uh, switch to uh, AVM, you can see what happens immediately. Um, the driving pressure went down, the flow, inspiratory flow went down, the tidal volume went down, and this is the target tidal volume where the ventilator is trying to calculate the target tidal volume. And again, of course, those ch change uh, breath to breath according to the compliance and the respiratory rate and everything. Uh, but it's nice visualization to see, um, despite we're here, you can see higher airway pressure. Uh, 
despite our best effort as clinicians at the bedside to reduce the mechanical power or use uh, less uh, pressures and volume, you can see that automatically uh, it dropped it by itself. Um, so how about the evidence for uh, adaptive ventilation modes uh, or AVM2 uh, mode in, in general? This is again a study that we did, simulation study. And we did this in, um, we compared AVM2 versus conventional ventilation modes in a normal lung model, it's a bench study. And basically normal compliance, normal resistance. And we did it in two levels of uh, percent minute ventilation. So experiment one, <clears throat> one A here with a comply uh, uh, with a hundred percent minute ventilation, and uh, experiment one B was one hundred fifty percent. Same here um, in experiment two, uh, two A and two B, but with different higher peak. And what we found is. Uh, Sorry, let me compare it. Blue is the uh, AVM. Uh, the orange here is uh, volume controlled mode. And the green is uh, pressure regulated volume control, which is basically a pressure control mode. So we discovered that in we basically tried to keep the same percent minute ventilation in all three modes with the same amount of PEEP. And you can tell immediately that AVM was uh, produced less mechanical power in all the experiments followed by the volume controlled followed by the pressure controlled mode. <clears throat> then we repeated the same study. We said, okay, let's see what happens in ARDS. So we went a little bit uh, maybe crazier here and I know it's a very um, a crowded slide, but basically what we did in three different levels or severity of ARDS, one was a compliance of 40, one was a compliance of 30, one was a compliance of 20. We call it mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. And we did the same uh, minute ventilation, 100%, which gives seven liters. Here, 150%, we give 10.5 liters, and 200%, 14 liters per minute. And again, we did it with different peeps, peep of 10, 15, 20. And again, the same, the blue is the AVM, the orange is uh, the volume controlled, and the gray here is the uh, pressure regulated volume control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, you can notice that in every single experiment, um, the adaptive ventilation mode was produced less mechanical power. Um, there is not much clinical studies as of yet uh, about um, uh, AVM2 um, uh, and um, clinical patients, uh, but this is a, a study a couple of years ago by Becher, which basically compared uh, AVM1 with AVM2. Um, it's a, a randomized crossover study. It was like a little bit small study. Um, and they compared AVM to AVM2. And again, you can see quickly here, tidal volume uh, targeted by AVM2 was less. The inspiratory pressure and the driving pressure was less, the respiratory less, uh, rate was less, <clears throat> the total mechanical power was less. Um, and then in the blood gas, the PA2-FI2 ratio uh, was, uh, was a little significant, but PaCO2, pH, mean, uh, mean arterial pressure, heart rate was not different. Um, again, here you can see the sort of the uh, patient criteria like, um, tidal volume, the mechanical power. So basically AVM2 showed uh, it reduced the mechanical power compared uh, to AVM1. Uh, I didn't put, sorry, uh, much slides about uh, uh, adaptive supportive mode, uh, ASV, uh, because our talk mostly was about AVM, but there's, uh, since AVM2 is uh, recent from 2017 or 18, there's not much studies, but ASV, has a lot of much uh, more studies. Now we are undergoing right now a clinical study uh, in our hospital comparing pressure control mode to AVM mode and clinical trial. And I just will have to warn you, this is um, not uh, published yet or not even peer reviewed. We just finished enrolling about 21 patients, uh, but I just looked at the numbers. I thought it might be interesting to share them with you. Um, 
we, uh, we got the first 12 patients. Um, they're all different diseases, so they're not all ARDS, but I thought it might be nice to have uh, different um, respiratory conditions. And what we did is we put the patient initially with uh, on pressure controlled ventilation and tried to optimize uh, uh, as much of the driving pressure and the tidal volume. Um, and after two hours, we switched to AVM2. Again, try to target the same minute ventilation that the patient was using on pressure control. And again, a quick calculation uh, of the average mechanical power. Um, as you can see, it's pretty high on the pressure control ventilation, 23 uh, plus or minus 7.2. And after we switched to um, AVM, uh, it went down to 17.44. There's no statistics. I don't know if those numbers will be um, um, significant or not. I think they will be, but again, I can't claim make any other claims. Uh, hopefully we'll publish the study soon. Um, I was asked one time about how about um, um, for our pediatric colleagues, what's the evidence of uh, adaptive ventilation modes um, in pediatrics and neonates? And I tried to search a little bit and I did not find much, much evidence uh, about in pediatrics. There's maybe just a couple of slides, uh, sorry, a couple of studies. Um, and this was a randomized crossover trial uh, comparing the driving pressure in a closed loop, um, like AVM, uh, like ASV, sorry, it was done uh, using ASV, and a conventional mechanical ventilation mode in pediatric patients. And they found um, that the delta pressure in ASV was lower compared to the driving pressure uh, in physician-tailored uh, APV uh, CMV, which is basically the pressure-regulated volume control in pediatric patients with different lung condition. So it was a uh, safe ventilation heterogeneous pediatric group. Um, there was another uh, study, but it was all written in Chinese and I couldn't translate it, so I did not include it. But what I found that there is actually an ongoing trial in clinicaltrials.gov um, since 2019 and trying to randomize um, um, pediatric patients uh, with ASV mode in children. Um, again, both modes are considered one of the, uh, the newer modes, so um, not much clinical trials as of yet. Now I'm gonna go through some uh, kind of uh, confusing or I would say partially answered or un uh, unanswered questions as it relates to mechanical power before we stop to, uh, to take some questions. Um, so, What's the relation of mechanical power and ventilator-induced lung injury? And I just have to warn you that uh, those green check marks and blue question marks and the red, those are my own opinion, my own interpretation. Um, so of course, um, you can have a different opinion or could be debated somehow. I think there is enough um, uh, evidence in the literature to show that mechanical power is related to ventilator-induced lung injury. And this is very, very important in our uh, every daily daily practice uh, in the ICU with ventilated patients. How about mechanical power and mortality? And again, um, I think the evidence are really compelling that mechanical power is related to mortality and targeting mechanical power uh, might save life. Now, the question of is a healthy lung or injured lung is more vulnerable to the mechanical power? Um, and here, I don't exactly know the answer. Um, there's actually some uh, physiology books that talks about maybe the healthy lung is more prone to injury, uh, but there's many articles also talk that the already injured lung is more vulnerable to mechanical power. Now, should we target respiratory, the total calculated respiratory mechanical power, or should we target the transpulmonary mechanical uh, power is better? Um, I showed you a couple of studies showing that maybe transpulmonary mechanical power is better. Uh, the problem is we need an esophageal balloon. Unfortunately, in clinical practice, um, maybe less than 1% um, uh, use of esophageal balloon. In Again, in my opinion, if you ask me, uh, the use of esophageal balloon and calculating the transpulmonary mechanical better. So basically, we're measuring uh, the effect of the 
pressure the volume on the lung, excluding the chest wall, um, will be important. Now, should we index the mechanical power? Uh, what are we, if yes, um, if you remember the slide of the elephant and the human and the rat, should we index it to the compliance or the elastance? Should we index to the amount of tidal volume, to the aerated area, to the FRC, to the ideal body weight? Um, it's not very clear, but again, the green check here is my opinion that we should probably uh, index it to something. And I'll show you in the next couple of slides. How about alveolar mechanical power that I talked about? This was not even studied uh, yet. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing some studies on the alveolar mechanical power. Now, what component of the power is more important? Um, is it the driving pressure? Is it the tidal volume? If it is the respiratory rate? Uh, probably they're all very important, but they might have different uh, weights here on the, um, in the mechanical power. But this again needs more work uh, because so far the studies are a little bit confusing and non-conclusive. How about O2 PEEP? Uh, if you notice, most of those calculations just mention PEEP. Does O2 PEEP cause worsening mechanical power? Probably yes, but again, we don't have much answer. Should we target a certain number? As you can, uh, uh, we talked about in the other studies, uh, it showed the cutoff of 17. Again, remember, uh, 17 in a normal lung might be well tolerated. In an ARDS lung, it might not be uh, tolerated. Um, we have to remember that our lungs are so heterogeneous, even the healthy lungs, not only the ARDS. So the mechanical power is not even well distributed all over our lungs. Uh, so this area here might, be, even if your mechanical power within that cutoff, say 14, 15, um, it might be injurious to part of the lungs and okay for other parts. Um, but this is a problem also with the same with the driving pressure, with the tidal volume, uh, with the PEEP. And that's why um, preventing ventilator-induced lung injury or totally obliterating ventilator-induced lung injury during invasive mechanical ventilation is probably impossible. Um, What's the best way of, to measure mechanical power? We talked about there's a lot of um, formulas. Um, probably the best way is to do the integration of the pressure volume curve. Um, how about when the patient is passive versus active? What's the role of the PMOS? Does the PMOS increase the mechanical power total to the respiratory system or it actually reduce it? And if you think about it, uh, in volume control, probably, uh, uh, when the patient breathes with the PMOS, probably the me uh, mechanical power would stay the same in pressure control because the added muscle pressure will increase the tidal volume. So probably the mechanical power would be higher. Automatic measurement, again, I think it's, we really need automatic measurement because otherwise at the bedside, <clears throat> it's so hard to keep track of the mechanical power. Now our closed loop modes are better at reducing mechanical power. Um, I hope I convinced you that there is a lot of evidence that they do. Uh, next few minutes, one, two minutes, we'll just go about some questions. Um, um, now, those are patients uh, here. Um, mechanical power is the same between patient on pressure control, pressure on patient on volume control. Um, you can see the settings. They're both passive with a compliance of 50 and resistance of 10. And they both have mechanical power the same. Now, uh, are they both prone to the same injury or, or no, because they're using different uh, amount of pressures, different amount of flow? Uh, that has to be answered. How about a patient here, um, a passive patient on the left here and an active patient with a PMOS and this simulator work again. So <clears throat> both of them have the same, almost the same amount of mechanical power, both the passive and uh, the active and both have the same compliance and resistance. Now are both prone to the same injury? Um, I don't know, this needs to be uh, studied. So are both the same or is one superior to the other? Um, we don't know. How about power compliance index? So those are patients, uh, same, sorry, um, different compliance, like the one on the left with low compliance resistance of 10 and low ideal body weight compared to the patient on the right with uh, higher compliance, so better respiratory uh, 
uh, 10 ideal body weight, so it's a bigger patient. But if you look at them, both mechanical power is calculated at 14.65. If we index it to the compliance, you would see that, of course, uh, the one with the low compliance has a higher, um, we try to call it power compliance index, PCI, is higher than the one on the right. If you uh, index it to the ideal body weight, again, it's higher on the left. So is that lung uh, with poor compliance is more prone to injury? Um, again, probably there's, it's not been studied yet. Um, again, we, I talked about the transpulmonary mechanical power. So those are patients, different patients. If you look without, you don't have the oesophageal, so airway pressure, flow, oesophageal pressure, and transpulmonary pressure. And most of the time, we don't have the oesophageal pressure. So we're just only looking at the top uh, two curves. And the calculated respiratory mechanical power here, both of them, 24.6. If you put an oesophageal balloon, you can see that the transpulmonary mechanical power on that patient on the left is actually higher than uh, the one on the right. So is that one more prone to injury? Um, I would say yes, but again, um, there is some evidence for it, but not totally. So we go back to the question is like, um, as clinicians, what do we do at the bedside to try to reduce that mechanical power? Of course, we have to tolerate the lowest respiratory rate, the lowest tidal volume, the lowest driving pressure, tolerate permissive hypercapnia. Um, of course, we have to put uh, adequate PEEP. And of course, the talk about uh, what is adequate PEEP or what's optimal PEEP or best PEEP, that's a very long conversation. Um, been, uh, clinicians have been trying to study it and debate it for the last 40, 50 years, still with no much answers. Should we put oesophageal balloons and calculate the transpulmonary uh, driving pressure uh, and mechanical power to exclude the pressure to inflate the chest wall? I would say yes. Um, how about the prone position? Uh, if you think about it, the prone position might reduce, it actually improves the lung heterogeneity to so try to make the lung more homogeneous. And uh, you might reduce the need for high driving pressure or high mechanical power. Um, of course, you have to look at the adequate sedation to reduce the large uh, pleural pressure swings and uh, you know um, high transpulmonary pressures. And asynchronous, of course, play uh, a big role in this. So we do what we have to do at the bedside, but again, we we can't look at one only parameter. Um, over the last two decades, um, uh, clinicians have been looking at low tidal volume, and as long as the tidal volume is below six, uh, we all considered it as uh, safe ventilation or long protective ventilation. Then the, the debate started Maybe we should look at driving pressure or respiratory pressure. And of course, the continued debate, debate is which one is more injurious? Is it the volume or is it the pressure? Um, in my mind, it's, of course, everything could be injurious. So we have to accept the lowest, uh, the lowest parameters. Something that I didn't even think about, if you look at the, the low tidal volume ventilation because of the high PCO2, um, most clinicians had to go up on the respiratory rate to try to prevent severe hypercapnia. And if you think about the higher respiratory rate, that's high, more uh, mechanical power. Think about the Rocky picture again. You keep, instead of getting uh, hit 15 times a minute, if you're in a boxing match, you might last a couple of rounds versus if you keep hit, being hit 30 respiratory rate, you might not last too, too long. Uh, lastly, um, how about adaptive modes? As I showed you, they do reduce the mechanical power and they do that breath by breath. We can't be at the bedside all the time as clinicians and every time something changes, whether it's respiratory rate or the compliance changed or um, the resistance changed, we can't keep going every couple of minutes to adjust the ventilator. What the, the great things about adaptive modes is basically you have an expert clinician um, living inside the ventilator, which is the computer, and it adjusts, uh, does this all adjustments automatically for you. Uh, with this, I'm just gonna say thank you and I hope it wasn't too long or too confusing. Uh, we'll be ready for any questions. Thank you so much, Ihab, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. First of all, 
what are some of the challenges associated when you're beginning to use adaptive modes and, and how have you overcome those? Oh, great, great question. Um, you know, as any mode of mechanical ventilation, it's a uh, uh, learning curve. Um, when you start work uh, in residency or fellowship and you start learning about how do I set the modes, uh, uh, volume control, pressure control, it's actually, you have to put more parameters. In adaptive ventilation modes, uh, as I said, um, you put only fewer, you only put the percent minute ventilation and the PEEP, and the ventilator does the rest of the calculations for you, what's optimum for you. So matter of fact, it's actually much easier than the other modes. Where I work right now, when we started using uh, ASV and AVM, initially the clinicians were kind of like, oh, what do I do? What is that? How do... Um, and now everybody loves it. If, without me saying anything, I come and the patient is already on those modes. Um, so I think once you try those modes, I think you would love them. That's great. Thank you. Um, another question. In the absence of a built-in software to calculate mechanical power for me, how do I implicate it in my practice using simple equations? Yeah. Um, of course, uh, you have to calculate it. You have to decide on uh, which formula is more accurate. Um, um, we don't know about which really which formula is more accurate. Actually, we're doing the study right now about trying to make even a more simplified formula. Uh, whatever formula you, you will use, because it's usually a trend. Uh, so every time you feel that there's something changed or you're going to do the calculations, uh, whatever formula you're going to change and try to um, to use the, the, the try to target the lowest. So if you find the uh, respiratory rate is higher, you, you keep coming, try to tolerate lower respiratory rate. So I think whatever formula so far, we should live with what we have, but hopefully the future will be easier. Great, thank you. For the same minute ventilation, does the mode of mechanical ventilation affect the mechanical power? Yes. Um, uh, as I showed you in the study we did on the simulator, uh, with this, uh, we compared the volume control mode, the pressure regulated volume control or uh, PRVC and the AVM, and we used the same uh, minute ventilation in all of them. And as you, if you remember those blue, orange and green, um, so they were totally different uh, because of the combination that uh, the ventilator uh, chose a certain driving pressure, certain respiratory rate, certain tidal volume. So it was uh, much better than the ones that we have manually to adjust. Plus also to add to this, um, again, you know, things change very quickly in the ICU. If you calculated the mechanical power and you put your parameters and you think you did great, and one minute later, uh, things change. Five minutes later, things change. Um, and we don't check on the patients every five minutes. Nobody, you know, uh, humanly Im impossible and we don't have the manpower. Uh, every four hours to go and it's like, oh my God, my mechanical power now is uh, much higher. I'm going to reduce it. Those four, six hours might make a difference for the patient. So. Thank you. The next one, it says, as per the mechanical power mechanism, a high PEEP increases the mechanical power and can increase mortality. Is there a study comparing the mortality and ventilator-induced lung injury in both mechanical power and ARDS? Um, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, there's lots of clinical studies about PEEP <clears throat> and mortality in ARDS. Um, if you remember back in the past, I think it was uh, early 2000s or late 1995, there was those famous big trials called alveoli trial, uh, express trial, and love trial, uh, that they were all huge studies that showed uh, maybe PEEP uh, didn't uh, correlate with mortality. Uh, but when they did the um, analysis for severe patients with ARDS, matter of fact, they found that higher PEEP was related to improved mortality um, with ARDS. Um, the combination of higher PEEP versus lower PEEP in adaptive ventilation mode, modes, um, I don't know if it was studied, but uh, um, I think uh, the adequate PEEP or the optimal PEEP should improve mortality. Uh, again, those studies are kind of also confusing because they put every ARDS patient in one bucket. 
We know that ARDS from pneumonia is different from ARDS from septic shock, from trauma, from drowning. So I don't think we should be talking about ARDS as one component. Uh, and that's why I really believe in um, individualized mechanical ventilation. Each patient is different from the other patient. Each patient needs different PEEP from another patient. But that's a big talk, but I think adequate PEEP in ARDS would improve mortality. Thank you. The next one asks, how will uh, adaptive ventilation modes respond to patients who are air hungry or fighting the ventilator? Will the increase in respiratory rate due to agitation or air hunger decrease the ventilator's target tidal volume or will it provide pressure support breaths? Well, that's a great question. So um, remember that the patient is still on the ventilator, regardless what the mode is. Uh, if they get agitated or are hungry or in pain, of course, they will all react to being the same. Tachypnic and increasing, you know, effort and stuff like that. And um, what the ventilator would do if the patient start to say the target respiratory rate was, for example, 15, and now the patient is agitated and breathing 30. So, of course, the ventilator would try to decrease the amount of pressure to try to target lower tidal volume to stay on that nice curve. Um, which might actually, if the patient, like the more you reduce the driving pressure and the tidal volume, our brain say like, no, 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 I don't like it. So sometimes it might go into a vicious cycle. And I think that um, not just specific for AVM modes, this goes for any mode of mechanical ventilation. And that's why um, a nice uh, sedation protocol and, you know, treatment of delirium and pain and stuff like that are important. Um, in general, once a patient is more spontaneously breathing and now the breath become pressure supported mode, it's actually much more usually tolerated with less dyssynchronous uh, compared to controlled uh, other controlled modes. So. Thank you. Um, has the patient size been found to have a noticeable impact on the success of using adaptive modes of ventilation? Uh, I'm sorry, can, can you say the patient size? Has the patient has the patient size been found to have an impact on the success of using adaptive modes of ventilation? Um, um, I, I don't think, again, I try to um, not only state my opinion, I try to be like, say, stay with the evidence. Um, I don't think there is um, uh, any evidence is, or studies done in different patient sizes or ideal body weight different, but um, again, remember, of course, when the patient is uh, morbidly obese and stuff like that, it will, and we're still targeting targeting the ideal uh, body weight. Um, again, it's diff not different than any other uh, ventilator modes. Um, again, I think the good thing with the adaptive modes is we have, we're forced to calculate the ideal body weight. Matter of fact, we don't calculate it, the ventilator calculates it for us. Uh, once we put the height, so it um, it's more basically a little bit protective. But I don't know exactly if there's um, I don't know the answer. <laughs> no worries, and we've got time for one more question. Do we have any information about the mechanical vac power in spontaneously breathing patients with ARDS? That's again another great question. Uh, so far, we do not have uh, any formulas. Uh, per se for spontaneous uh, patient. Uh, but we calculate the total uh, mechanical power. So if you remember that pressure volume curve, so it's basically whatever formula you're gonna use, uh, it will be the total power going to the patient because it's the volume times the pressure times the respiratory rate. Um, if you wanna really calculate the, how much the muscle pressure, the patient pressure, now you have to have an esophageal balloon I'll calculate the PMOS and, you know, it, it becomes really more, uh, more difficult. But again, whatever pressure he's getting, whatever volume, whatever respiratory rate, that's a whole uh, mechanical power that the lung or the respiratory system is exposed to. So I think we still can use the whatever equation that we use so far. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. I want to say a huge thank you so much for your excellent presentation. And thank you to all of our attendees who have joined us live today. And I wish you all a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.